Well, I think the biggest thing is to, um, you know, again, I want to thank the, the Orange Bowl and uh, all the committees that are able to, to be around us, all the Orange Coats and, and everybody that, that helps put this uh, tremendous bowl game on. This is a, an honor and a privilege uh, to be playing in one of the most storied BCS bowl games in, in the history of college football. Um, but to answer your question, I think we, uh, with a couple days left, we've, we've got to really fine tune uh, the game plan. I think we've got to make sure that we're smart with the, the reps, the amount of pounding that we do uh, on our guys. We certainly want our guys to be fresh come Friday night. Uh, but we've also got to get some work done, too, in terms of um, finalizing the, the, uh, the preparations and the, the fine tuning of, of the game plan. All right, as I mentioned, we have uh, Corey Lindsley and Jack Muhort here with us. We'll open up with a few questions for them, um, and then we will excuse them to the room for the breakout sessions, then we'll go back to coach. So uh, any questions for the student athletes? We'll Hi. go over here all the way to the right Hi, in the second row. Uh, can you talk about the challenge of going against Vic Beasley? What kind of challenge that presents to you? Yeah, obviously, uh, Vic Beasley is a tremendous player, um, defensive end. He's very quick off the edge, uh, kind of a speed rush guy, but he can also give you a little bit of power, too. So. Um, I've been preparing for him, you know, since the Bulls got drawn, and you know, uh, I think it's going to be a great challenge for me. I'm really looking forward to it, and um, you know, it's, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So, I guess we'll see on Friday night how that goes. Uh, he's a little bit more unique than uh, any D end I played against in the Big Ten so far. So, um, it's like like you said, um, it's a little bit of a unique challenge, and uh, I'm preparing for him, you know. Uh, just as hard or harder than anybody I've played against this year. So, uh, like I said, I'm excited, and it's, it's going to be a good matchup. We do have two microphones, so if you can uh, flag them down, they'll bring the microphone to you. Announce your name and where you're from and your question, please. Hey, Corey, down here in the middle, Tim Reynolds of the AP here in Miami. Y you guys were obviously just a play or two away from going to a different bowl game. H how long did it take you guys to get over and kind of, kind of refocus on, on what you have in front of you instead of what might have been? I'd say it took about a week, um, but we, we have such a close, tight-knit bond, I guess, on this team that we were able to kind of come together and, and say, you know, we got to do this one last time. Let's make it um, the best that we can. So, I mean, it, it really stung, obviously. You know, I, <clears throat> I think I can speak for everybody on the team when I, when I say it really stung. But um, with guys like this, with the, the character we have on this team, it's not hard to... Um, I mean, it is hard, but it doesn't take a long uh, duration of time to get over um, something like that because we know we're going to face uh, bigger tests in life. Okay, we'll go down here in the front row all the way to the right. Uh, this one's for Jack Andrea Adelson, ESPN.com. What makes Vic Beasley unique? Is it the size and speed uh, that he has? Yeah, I think it's a combination of speed and power, you know, which will make any, any player a good football player. At defensive end, that's a really good thing to have. You know, he can run around you, or, you know, if he chooses to, he can go right through you or, you know, take an inside move. So he's got a three-way go, and uh, he's got a good motor. He's very good with his hands. And, um, you know, if you're not prepared for him, he'll, he'll get the best of you. So that's what I'm working on right now is uh, just, you know, the, all the his inside move right through me and going around me. So. Um, if I can prepare for those three moves, I, sh I should be all right. All right. All the way to the left in the second row. Yes, for both of you guys, uh, Corey and, uh, and uh, Jack, are y'all getting a little misty now, knowing you're going to about to play your last game together? And uh, what has made this offensive line, you think, unique? Um, yeah, we are. We're taking in every moment that we can to be together and have fun and everything. And um, I guess the thing that's made it unique in my perspective is that uh, – just the bond again. There's no, I guess there's no drama or other. You know, I don't, I don't know what you want to call it, but uh, in our room, we're all really good friends. We all came in together with uh, respect to Nor, who I mean, basically is you know one of us. But um, I, I think it's just the bond between the friendship that we've developed over these past four years. We're right here on the front row on the right. This is for both you guys. Um, if you could talk a little bit about Carlos Hyde with the challenges he faced at the beginning of the year and then how he evolved into being one of the top running backs in the country? I think, uh, you know, the challenges he faced and the, the way he overcame them you know, speaks a lot to who he is. And, uh, you know, he didn't sulk. And, uh, you know, anytime he was around us, he was positive. And obviously when he came back, he ran with a lot of passion, ran hard, and, you know, made us to look good. So, um, you know, we're proud of him for the way he responded. And he's had a tremendous year. 
and uh, you know obviously we have one more game to prove you know that he is the best running back in the country and I think that's the way we both feel up here so um, you know very proud of him like we said that the, the way he overcame those struggles about it <laughs> <laughs> I'll go on this all the way to the right in the second row yes could you uh, address how Marcus Hall has bounced back from what happened against Michigan not playing against Michigan State how's he been in ball preparations um, Marcus is, uh, you see the drive in him that, you know, he's always had a drive about him. But um, after that uh, <coughs> incident, we were all kind of waiting in the locker room. We were waiting in the locker room um, post that game. And uh, just to, you know, be there for him. And we knew he was going to take it to heart because that's not, that's on Marcus. That was in the heat of the moment, Marcus. That's not him as a person, that, you know. So um, it, it's definitely put a little fire under underneath him and um, he, he's definitely improved as much as he's improved all season and you know people call him the most improved offensive lineman in the nation um, he's definitely improved that much more during goal practice and it's not in Marcus's nature to stay down for long so he's bounced back very well and uh, he's another guy that's just always very positive and has a smile on his face so we love him for that any other questions for Jack and Corey up here all right, we are going to. Oh, we do have one all the way on the right hand side. Speaking of the um, uh, the mentions of Beasley, I think they're the either the leader or, or in the top group of teams in the country with tackles for loss. So it's not just him. They have other guys who get into the backfield and, and cause some problems. What have you seen scheme wise that allows them to do that? Why are they so skilled at stopping people in the backfield? Uh, I'm sure Corey will tell you they also have you know some very good inside players and you know, uh, good motors like I mentioned earlier. They're very good with their hands and they play hard and. I think that's you know something that makes any D line you know effective, and you know they're no different. So it doesn't surprise me to hear that stat that they're high up there in TFLs. And uh, you know, like I said, we got to be prepared to play against a good a good bunch of players, and I think we will be. And we're gonna stay all the way on the right, a few rows back. For either one of you guys, uh, can you just talk about Braxton Miller, the demeanor you see in him uh, leading up to this game? Um, yeah, he's he's definitely been um, getting on us a little bit. More than he is usually than he has usually. Um, he's developed along, you know, side Coach Meyer, Coach Herman. He, he's developed a, a sense of uh, leadership throughout the whole season. You definitely hear his presence more than you have in the past. Um, so I mean, he, he's <clears throat> he's the same person off the field that he was. The, the cool guy that I know, you know, easy to talk to, um, very humble. Um, but on the field, he's definitely uh, developed a, um, a voice, I guess you could say. He's in the huddle, and although we don't huddle most of the time. <laughs> but, uh, figure of speech. Yeah. Figure of speech. But, uh, yeah, he, he's definitely developed a, a voice on the field throughout the whole season, especially in this ball practice. All right, we're going to let Jack and Corey get over to uh, the player breakout room. Uh, I'm going to let Coach talk real quick. Carlos Hyde is going to be over there along with uh, uh, Corey Philly Brown. Uh, Braxton Miller is not with us this morning. Coach, you want to talk real quick just about where yeah, he is? Yeah, Bra uh, it's, it's been probably well documented. Uh, uh, we've had some stomach viruses going around, and uh, he woke up with, uh, this morning not, not feeling too well. So uh, just as a precaution, we're going to let him stay back with the trainers. Uh, we do expect him to, to practice this afternoon uh, as it is a, a Wednesday for us in terms of uh, getting ready for a Saturday game, if you will. And so uh, we just wanted to take that precaution, make sure that he stayed back and get all the rest and fluids that, that he could get. Okay. Uh, we will now open it up for questions for Coach. If we can bring the microphone right down here in the front row. Coach, in regards to uh, Carlos, uh, is there anything in particular you – said to him to help him get through those first first few weeks after he was suspended play hard uh, you know the that your your team needs you to go down to the scout team for uh, for those three weeks and prove to them that that you're uh, a team player and that you care about them more than you care about yourself and uh, I don't know if it was me or I mean I think that message was was relayed to him. Uh, through a number of different different sources, so, um, but that certainly was probably the biggest one was go out and practice your your tail off, and um, make sure that your your teammates understand that they're more important to you than than even you yourself. 
We also asked before we get to our next question, any of the TV crews uh, not to use wireless microphones in the player breakout rooms as we had interference in here. Um, so please hardwire all microphones. We'll go over here on the left in the front row. Tom, by season's end, did you guys evolve into the offense that you thought you'd be when the season started? Were you able to do everything that you envisioned uh, when you set out and, and saw the weapons you had when the season began? I, th I think we evolved kind of uh, we, we, separate phases, if you will. Um, I, I think we certainly made some dramatic improvements throwing the football from, from where we were last year and uh, through the middle part of the season. I think that showed. I think we regressed maybe a little bit um, as um, you know our bodies got fatigued and we started losing a, a little bit of numbers on the perimeter and guys were playing more snaps and playing banged up and um, you know the competition got tougher a little bit too and so um, but the the beauty of it is, I mean we're, we're not going to change who we are we're, we're not uh, um, we're not going to throw the football 50 times a game, but we, we did feel like after last season we needed to, to throw it more effectively and efficiently. And I, I think we uh, started that process. Again, I, I think we might have taken a step or two back, which allowed us some things to work on during bowl prep. Um, but we're, we're a downhill uh, inside zone two-back run team that just happens to do it from the shotgun and, and add the quarterback run as, as part of the element. and. Um, you know, but we felt like last year teams were able to kind of crowd the line of scrimmage on us and, and make it really, really difficult to to maintain that identity. And uh, I think having at least an eff effective, um, productive passing game has allowed us to continue that mode of operation. Kind of build, uh, just one quick follow up, kind of building off of that with Dontre Wilson, uh, a guy who early in the season looked like he would have a really big role. And then in the last two games, we obviously he was out of the Michigan game, right. but even in the Michigan State game, minimal uh, impact. Just your thoughts on his the way he evolved this season? Yeah, um, probably did not evolve into the complete player that that we thought that he would be. So uh, I think kind of the the term we used early in the year was a, more of a novelty when he was in, and so we needed him to be a, a more every down player and was slower to progress in that area. And then, to be quite honest with you, we thought we would need him, and by need, I mean need, need him to, to win more games and to score points. And at the end of the day, you've got what we believe is the, the best offensive line in the country. You've got one of the top two or three running backs in the country. You've got a quarterback in Braxton Miller that – I mean, these guys were touching the football, and, and I mean, really good things were happening to us offensively. And so, um, you, you hate to disrupt that rhythm a little bit. And uh, um, so, and and we've told, we've talked to Dontre about that. It's certainly not a wasted year by any stretch of the imagination with his kick return yards and um, rush yards and receiving yards. It's a, a very productive season for a true freshman. Um, and uh, you know, I think he's got a thousand all-purpose shards or close to it and and uh, you know another year in the weight room and in off-season training and training you know at kind of both positions uh, you know slot receiver and, and running back will uh, increase his his value and production as as we move forward in his career Go over here in the front row on the right well what's your relationship like with chad morris very good i like chad he's a good Good dude. I mean, we, we, we go way back to when uh, uh, I was, you know, I spent 11 years coaching college football in, in the state of Texas and um, recruited his schools and have known him uh, all the way from the time he was down uh, as the head coach of the Bay City Black Cats. Um, and uh, so me and Chad go way back. Uh, I wouldn't say we're, we're best buddies. I mean, we don't, we don't go on vacation together or anything like that. But... Um, we do spend a lot of time talking football over the phone and as has been documented, spent some time this off season uh, in person with our staffs and it's been, been a very good, good productive working relationship. Second all the left. Yeah, Tom, with, with that in, in mind, I was asking Tim him Columbus yesterday. Dispatch. Yeah, that's right. Tim Columbus Please. Dispatch. Um, 
Well, with that in mind, I was asking Chad yesterday, what, what, what's going to be the next step? What do you see as the next step offensively? Both of you guys are supposedly on the cutting edge of what's going on. You know, uh, Him more than me if yeah. you look at his paycheck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's double, right? Plus. But, uh, but I digress. Uh, what do you see as the next step eventually in, in, in the way the offenses are going? Do you see a regression more than a – you know what I mean? What, what do you see out there? Oh, I think – it's funny you ask that. I, I think that defenses are making it harder to throw the football uh, with so many in out of spread formations. I, I think there's uh, so many combination coverages that teams uh, over the last five or six years have developed and not perfected, but but um, gotten very good at to still hold up against the spread run game, but but also stop the the spread pass game too or not stop but at least attempt to and so I think uh, as you see with us a little bit even though we're in the gun and we have three wide receivers and all that but sometimes getting them a little bit closer and, and, and moving guys around a little bit kind of helps break up some of those coverages I know for us it's it's been challenging to try to find you know you go back to last year you know the, the Big Ten championship game you say okay so very well documented. Their their quarters coverage with press on the outside. Their safeties are standing at seven yards. They've got nine in the box. The minute the the ball is snapped, and so you say, okay, well, what's your answer? Well, throw it. Okay, great. Where are you going to throw it? They still have nine guys within you know the the short to intermediate passing areas. They're pressing your outside guys. So um, you know you're going to throw it over their head. Try to throw it over their head twenty times a game. I, you know I don't know that that's uh, um, a road that we want to go down. So I think it's important that we continue to find ways to make sure that uh, that we're still able to run. That. I mean, I think, at least for us, the offense is built around the run game. And so when teams devise coverages to, to add hats or people to, to stop the run game, you have to be able to counter that by throwing the football. And I think that's the biggest challenge for us is to kind of find those different ways based on the coverages we're seeing now as opposed to maybe four or five years ago when defenses were just now getting a taste of, of what of what we were trying to do offensively. Front row on the right here. Yes, could you talk a little bit about uh, Jeff Hireman and how he's progressed this season? Yeah, gotten uh, become a really good player these last uh, month or two. Uh, thought he had improved throughout last season and then uh, two a day they didn't have a great training camp and uh, the first few weeks of the season we, we weren't sure if he had made the progress that we thought he did and then uh, I would say probably the last six eight weeks of the season has really really come along and uh, probably at his best it's funny you asked me that it's he probably had his best practice uh, in our two years here just yesterday I mean just um, played his tail off for whatever it was, 20 periods out there in the heat and, and was uh, uh, very, very effective for us. And so we're excited uh, that, that he has continued to improve. Over on the front row on the left. What you mentioned about uh, Chad Morris's paycheck, I would imagine you think that million dollar coordinators is that was one a, of... That was a joke, no, by but the way, Doug. But don't you think it's one of the great developments in college football history, right, for coordinators to make... I mean, you must be all for that, right? I think just like any profession, whatever the market um, demands, that people should be paid what the market demands and, and what their value to that market is. And so uh, I don't think it, it's um, unique to our profession. Um, it maybe actually has been a little bit behind in our profession, to be honest with you, based on other professions and the willingness to pay market value for um, for people that are in that high of demand. 